speaker. Uh, Rianne Kinney is the founder of the Kinney Firm a and is a licensed Florida attorney, legal consultant, and author with experience in market and business strategy. Today, her firm represents and advises founders and businesses of every size across industries in the areas of corporate information, copyright, trademark e-commerce, as well as strategy and long-term planning. Today, Rianne's here to talk to us about CYA, your site. Do, do you guys know what CYA is? It means cover your assets. Come on now. Friends, put your hands together for Rianne. Good afternoon. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have privacy policies on your websites? Fantastic. So um, as he mentioned, I am an attorney, and I spend most of my day advising people uh, how to get out of scrapes that they've gotten into, um, which is why I'm here to talk to you today, to hopefully make sure that you don't get into that situation, because preventing uh, an issue, a legal matter, is a lot cheaper than having to deal with it uh, once something has gone wrong. So um, in looking at CYA and your site, the two main things that we're going to be talking about today are a privacy policy and terms of use. The reason that you have uh, the, the legal documents on your site is threefold. One, for compliance with laws. Two, to establish credibility with your clients. And three, to deter lawsuits. So when we're looking at compliance, a lot of people don't know uh, still that they are legally required to have a privacy policy if they collect any personally identifiable information. What's personally identifiable information? Email address, name, practically anything in a contact form means that you're required to have a privacy policy under California state law. It's CALAPA, uh, the California Online Privacy Protection Act. Why are we talking about CALAPA in Florida? Why do we care about California law? Because if you collect any information from a California citizen, if they're located there, you're liable uh, for that law, and you can be uh, sued in California for the, a violation of that law. Similarly, um, some of you may have heard of the recent uh, international uh, development with the GDPR, um, the General Protection Data Regulation. This has been a move to standardize uh, data protection across the EU uh, and also Great Britain. And they've actually broadened the scope of uh, identifiable information. Um, now they're not just talking about collecting data such as uh, name or email address or um, something like that, but they're actually talking about collecting photos, biometric data, and IP addresses. And similarly to um, how we do things in the US with the uh, California law, you're liable and you're responsible for adhering to this law if you collect any data from uh, citizens of the EU. Again, we're talking IP addresses, so how are you going to limit um, that exposure? Um, outside of uh, adopting the privacy policy and conforming with the law, there are, um, you know, I'm sure Syed can, can tell you with the, um, the shopping carts, um, you can actually limit jurisdiction by not allowing certain customers um, to, to purchase your product. Um, but again, when they're visiting the website, you're going to want to uh, conform to these laws. Another uh, distinction that the GDPR makes um, as uh, different than, than the U.S. Um, is they actually differentiate uh, the type of information collected into two categories, um, being personal identify, um, information and sensitive data. And sensitive data actually has uh, even more stringent requirements for um, what you have to do when you're uh, collecting the information. You have to get clear and unambiguous consent when collecting this information now. So they differentiate the types of consent by the types of data you collect. Um, and the um, sensitive information opting in is the only require, or excuse me, the only acceptable way of collecting this sensitive data. So if you're collecting somebody's health information, their height, their weight, their ethnicity, their religion, um, if you had any of that, then you were required to opt in. You cannot have a checked box anymore. Um, and when we're looking at 
where uh, the law is going, adhering to that now, um, before, before number one, you get sued, but, but adhering to it now when it's such an easy fix um, and, and opting in is just great practice. Um, even if the law didn't require it, I mean, there's a business uh, and legal balance that you have to do. Um, obviously, you know, Syed was saying, you know, if, if somebody uh, has something in the cart and they have to create a user account, are they going to leave your site? Where you can have people take that, that actual physical act and check a box, you're going to want to do that. Um, so talking about terms of use, uh, again, anytime you put a website, and I know a lot of you already know, but once, anytime you have a website, you're putting it on the world wide web. You can be sued anywhere unless you limit your jurisdiction. So that's what the terms of use is. It's the contract that you have between uh, your, the users of your website, um, and you can limit your, your jurisdiction to the, your home state. Um, you're going to want to look at um, your content. Uh, if you allow people to add reviews or comments, you're allowing them to submit content which could be uh, infringing material. So you're going to want to have a policy in your terms of use um, that spells out who owns the content on your website. Um, are you licensing to third parties um, and, and limit that uh, liability that way? The other thing is, um, you're going to want to register with the Library of Congress, the Copyright Office, a designated copyright agent. This is free. It takes five minutes. Um, I don't have slides today, but I will have them on my website, and I'm going to provide links to you all. Um, but by registering a designated copyright agent, uh, you're afforded certain legal protections if someone were to claim infringement. You're basically just telling um, the copyright agency that we're going to conform to the law, you're appointing somebody, anyone at your, at your office, it could be you, you're providing your name, email address, contact information that you would already have in your terms of use anyway, but you're spelling it out that you're conforming with the DMCA, that's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, so that covers uh, the infringement aspect. So. Um, privacy policy I wanted to revisit just to say um, if any of you all work with people that are developing websites for children uh, under 13, in your privacy policy you're going to want to spell that out um, because they have the Child Online Protection, uh, Privacy Protection Act, COPPA, <laughs> CALOPPA and COPPA. Um, so you're going to have uh, different rules and responsibilities. You're, you're going to have to um, adhere to parental guidelines um, and allow parents the ability to, to control um, what their children uh, are able to do on that site and also the information that you collect from the children. So that is pretty much <laughs> um, the, the nutshell of terms of use and privacy policy, but I would love to answer your questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a collection form. Um, so, I mean, there's many different ways. And being developers, I, I know you guys are probably more familiar than I am. But, um, you know, with the contact form, where, where do you live? Are you consenting to, you know, um, me shipping this, that kind of thing? So, yeah, ask the questions. And you're creating a contract. Um, when you're asking them a question and they're providing you the information, you have that in writing. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Well, you're getting the, the consent, so you're, you're complying with that aspect, but the, the requirement is that you have a privacy policy. They're very inexpensive. Um, you know, it's, it's very quick, easy to put that on there, so once you have that, you're complying with the law, so... Is that a bad idea? 
Well, I mean, obviously, as an attorney, I'm going to tell you, yeah, that's a really bad practice. Um, again, I mean, I think a lot of people have a, an old um, antiquated notion that anytime you see an attorney, you're looking at a $10,000 retainer and you have to drive to a downtown office and, uh, you know, it's three hours of your day. But the Internet's disrupted every industry. The way we all deliver services is different. So I'm, I work from home. Uh, my clients, a lot of times, I'm not meeting with them. Um, and that reduces the cost to my clients because I don't have to charge for the overhead. So you can find, you get to interview attorneys the same way uh, they get to interview you for the job. Will you charge me a flat fee? Um, you know, that's what I do with my clients to, to make sure because I work specifically with business owners. And when you're starting out, you don't know what your accounts receivable are. Things are inconsistent. You're going to, um, you're going to want to, um, you know, get that flat fee per project where you can. And if you're speaking to an attorney that doesn't want to work at the rate that you want them to work or they're not open to that, find a different attorney. There are enough of us out there that are specializing. Find the one that works for you. Up here? I don't advise on error and emission policies. Um, that would be uh, your your insurance company. I mean, basically, it's it's what you can afford. But again, the cost of a privacy policy is going to be significantly less than honestly the insurance companies evaluate that when they're issuing your policy. Do you have these things in place? Um, if you don't have a terms of use or privacy policy, a lot of times your rates can actually go up, much like uh, home insurance when you don't have, you know, wind protected shutters in, in Florida, you know, it's, it's an added risk that you have. Up here? Well, well, I mean, attorneys use templates as well. I mean, again, when we're talking about actually somebody that lives in the state that you're in that is familiar with the laws that you have to adhere to, it's not, like I said, this isn't thousands of dollars. This is, you can find an attorney and, and actually have somebody that knows your business and the technology that you're dealing with. Because that, that a lot, that's a lot of this too. Um, finding attorneys that are familiar with the tech space and what kind of um, information you're gathering, how you're doing it and storing it. Not all privacy policies are created equal. There's, there's certain clauses that are the same thing over and over and over. And to that extent, I mean, if, if the choice is don't have a privacy policy or have the cheapest thing you can find, have the cheapest thing you can find. Um, have a privacy policy. If you get nothing else from me um, today, it is absolutely critical and crucial that you do. And again, I mean, there's the legal liability, which you can, you can easily avoid. But when your clients are looking at you, you're holding yourself out to be a professional, and you don't have a privacy policy, and you're not following the law and doing what you need to do, how does that look to them? You're not even doing, you know, having the attention to detail um, to cover yourself. So, um, you know, that's, that's the credibility component. Um, and again, when, uh, for, for the deterrence, if you have that in place, they think, at the very least, they think, oh, wow, this guy is following the law, he's got an attorney, I don't want to, you know, press that further. And it, same thing with the terms of use. You have the, the rules in place, it's a clear understanding between the two parties. Um, so, you know, the, the likelihood that someone is going to sue you when you have all of that in place goes down drastically versus not having anything there, them having to hunt you down and having no agreement between the two of you because anything they say goes. Yes, sorry, I'll, I'll come back. I'm sorry, did you just ask if a, a contact, if you use a contact form? Contact form. Yes, that's collecting. That's personal identification. Absolutely. Okay. That's yes, I want to restate this because this is what I deal with all, all day long. And if you have a contact form, it doesn't matter if, if it's a blog, 
If you only collect an email address, that is collecting personally identifiable information. You must have a privacy policy. And a lot of people, you know, oh, well, they don't really enforce it. You know, people aren't actually coming after me for not having a privacy policy. They enforce it arbitrarily, basically, uh, as a fundraiser. Uh, the state of California in 2012 decided that they were going to enforce Calapa and went after 50,000 um, web developers, uh, app developers, and sent out the notice that said, you have 30 days to get your privacy policy up or you're going to be hit with, uh, I think it was um, 10,000, no, excuse me, $5,000 per download of the app. Yeah. So again, uh, if you have access to a cheap privacy policy, you're, you're not able to you know, get the professional, you know, the full, the full uh, privacy. Get something up, please. Please, <laughs> don't, don't have to come with me with a lawsuit. Uh, it's so easily fixable. You, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so there's state, state and federal law jurisdiction. It can actually be somewhat complicated. Um, but when there's a meeting of the minds, when you have an agreement with somebody that they're agreeing that the lawsuit and the proper jurisdiction is in the state of Florida, then it would be in the state of Florida. Now, there's, um, there's certain ways that they can pull it into federal court if it you know, asks or, or raises a specific issue or question. But uh, again, typically if you're agreeing to it. Now, um, for, for Europe, um, if you are if you're a data processor, you have to actually appoint um, a registered agent or an agent in Europe. So that's how they're going to attach jurisdiction there uh, and be able to sue U.S. companies by serving. Right. I'm trying to get to all your questions. <laughs> Yes. It's it's not about dragging you to Europe, but yeah, they can fine you. They can they can they can suspend your website or allow it not to be uh, viewed in their country. Um, there's a lot of different parameters. The violation um, the for GDPR is four percent of your global annual um, intake or $20 million, whichever is greater. It's a sliding scale. Obviously, I don't think they're going to be coming after me for $20 million, but this is a very real law. This is something very uh, serious to, to look into. Um, and again, in 15 minutes, I can't tell you all about it, but I did tell you the name of it, that you need to be aware of it, so you can find an attorney, look it up, um, and get more information on how to, to, to better protect your business. Yes, ma'am. to protect your own work. Yeah, um, you're gonna wanna, I mean, depending on what, what type of work do you do? Okay, so um, you're typically talking about copyright um, with that. So that's the Library of Congress, um, the, the Copyright Office. Um, that's something that I do, that's uh, something that a lot of attorneys that work with businesses do, copyright and trademark. It's your intellectual property. That has a lot of value when you're looking to resell. Um, but you're gonna wanna file a copyright for that. Quick, quick uh, run through of copyright. You have uh, an automatic copyright anytime you uh, create an original work of authorship and, and fix it in a tangible medium. So as soon as you write something down, as soon as you create it on your computer, you automatically have copyright. Well, Ryan, why do I have to register my copyright if I already have it? If you want to uh, file suit or actually defend your work um, from, from infringement, you must have it registered with the office in order to be able to win uh, or, or defend a suit. Also, you're entitled to uh, treble da damages and attorney's fees and costs, which a lot of times you might be able to find an attorney that will do um, contingent work because, it, you know, if you have a strong case, so you're not, as a small business owner, coming up with the $30,000 to, to defend that suit. Um, yes, uh, and again, uh, the, the filing fee, um, excuse me, federal, federal filing fee for uh, copyright is like $65. Yeah. 35 in, uh, in some cases. 
You're responsible in your privacy policy for stating what your uh, third party um, policies are. And I have, I have third party people. I'm not liable or responsible for them. They have separate pr privacy policies that govern this. You're making your, your um, clients aware that there are, in fact, third parties. That's something that you want to uh, disclose. Yeah. Their privacy policy governs, governs their site. You're, you're stating uh, in writing that my privacy policy only covers me. I am not legally responsible or liable for anything I dare do. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Um, so pri privacy policy, uh, as uh, uh, written in, into Calapa, must be on the uh, f uh, homepage. Um, either um, either uh, on the home page or the first uh, identify what is it identifiable page, and it must uh, clearly state privacy in the hyperlink if it's if it's a link. So um, it needs to be readily available and clear and unambiguous uh, terms and conditions. Yes. Right. I'm, and this is a, a value-added service. And again, we're talking about credibility and something that you're bringing to your clients. You can send them an email and say, um, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. And just so you know, um, by, by having uh, a website on the internet, you're probably going to want to have a terms of use uh, and privacy policy because you're legally required to. I see you have a contact form here. You don't, that's not giving legal advice. You're telling them that they probably want to go do that. I wouldn't recommend you giving them a privacy policy because if the law changes and you don't have something in there, um, then they can sue you because you gave them a faulty privacy policy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, she was. I'm sorry. Well, that, was, that brings me to the next thing I was going to mention, which is we'll have the speakers repeat every time someone asks a question. Repeat the question. That way, the whole room can hear because we don't have any mic runners. So maybe you guys can chat here if we can wrap things up. One more time for Leanne. Thank you so much.